Welcome brave souls to Fear File Chronicles, your one-way ticket to spine-chilling stories and terrifying tales. Tonight, we'll be diving into the darkest corners of the human mind with the story, Ricketts, Part 1, penned by the twisted mind of Locked 334. Together, we'll explore the unexplained and face our deepest fears. But before we begin, if you enjoy trembling in terror, be sure to hit that like button share this video with your fellow fear fanatics and subscribe to our channel don't forget to click the bell notification so you never miss an eerie episode your support truly means the world to us so feel free to leave a comment below to join the fear file chronicles community now without further ado let's unravel the mysteries of the unknown together as we delve into tonight's fear inducing story ricketts part one Dim the lights and prepare yourself for a chilling journey into the Fear File Chronicles. I will preface this story by saying that I probably deserve the torment I have endured over the last year. I am not a perfect person, and the mistakes I have made throughout my life have hurt those I care about most. The truth of the matter is, I am an alcoholic, and living with those behaviors is what led to this. I have lied. I have manipulated, I have stolen, and I have misused the trust of people that care about me most. For those I have wronged, I hope that this can also be a way of repentance. For those I have not, I hope it can be a warning. It was late May, 2022. I cannot remember the exact day because that would require me to be in a sober state of mind for more than one day at a time. I am assuming because on my night drives, Several teenagers were cruising the roads. This meant summer was upon us, and when you live in the middle of nowhere in lower Alabama, there is very little to do other than ride around or congregate in the parking lot of the local Walmart. It was annoying. Their happy banter and joyous laughter only reminded me of my age. The sun had long since hidden behind the horizon, and the air was unbearably humid so I had the AC cranked to max in my little Chevy S10, but kept the windows down so I could still serenade people with my dashboard karaoke between sips. It had to be a Saturday, because I had worked the day before and had started drinking at 8 a.m. It would be hard for me to prove to anyone I was sober. I was truly lucky I had never been pulled over for DUI or killed anyone while swerving through the various areas I would travel on my escapades. I am 37 and with two failed marriages, children I rarely spend time with, and the fact I am stuck living in this repetitive cycle of self-destruction, I truly feel as though I have failed at life. Country artist Luke Combs comes over the radio, and I sing along with, Beer never broke my heart. By all accounts, alcohol has always been there for me. But the truth of the matter is, it has caused me more pain than anything. I was driving intoxicated, screaming the words to the song and wiping tears from my eyes that night when it happened. The lights of the town had disappeared, which meant I could take another gulp of the whiskey I'd poured into the sealed container that I had hoped no one would notice. Never mind the fact that anyone who approached my vehicle would have no problem smelling it all over me. The tires of my truck cracked across gravel and dirt as I found a secluded back road to hide away my shame for a while. My headlights danced between two deep ruts on each side of the very narrow pathway. The trees stacked tight adjacent to them, the boughs hanging low almost as if they were warning me to turn back. I could hear the branches scratch at the paint on the roof of my vehicle as they tried their best to slow me down. I was unfazed. My glazed eyes scanned the tree line in hopes of finding somewhere to pull off and finish my one-man party. A mile turned into two, and the woods around me seemed to get thicker. Soon, the canopy covering this private road had blotted out the moon. I had absolutely no idea where I was, and, in my state, truly did not care. My speed had increased far higher than anyone should ever go on such a narrow pathway. And when the sudden curve arrived, I panicked. Discarded cigarette packaging, trash, and my cup went hurtling through the air as I drunkenly shoved my foot onto the brake pedal and jerked the wheel to the right. 
The tires grasped at the road for purchase, but found only loose red clay that had been turned to sand in the Alabama sun. I expected to land with a thud in the ditch to my left, but instead, a clearing appeared on that side. I thought I was saved. My now sobering sight then fell on the small wooden cross that had been driven into the ground at the base of a large oak tree, before my truck crumpled against both of them. Those last few milliseconds came slowly. I can remember them as vividly as any childhood memory. It was red clay, grass, a small wooden cross, and a tree. The grass had overgrown a bit, but I could still make out the reds, yellows, and pinks of flowers growing around the cross. Most importantly, I remember the name carved into the cross. Now I have had my share of hangovers. None were what I would consider pleasant experiences, but when my eyelids fought their way open the next morning, I was truly in another realm of pain. Bright light permeated the room, and when I tried to raise my hand to shield them, I noticed I could not. I was handcuffed to a hospital bed. My body ached in places I did not know it could, and there was this terrible ringing in my head. A nurse entered shortly after, turning down the lights and explaining where I was and why. The crash had fractured my left foot, a few ribs, broken my right wrist, and separated a few discs in my back. Needless to say, even without the cuffs, I was not going anywhere, anytime soon. I was charged with driving while intoxicated, reckless endangerment, and destruction of private property. The judge admitted they would have tacked on more charges if they could prove I had driven through populated areas in my condition. They wanted me to spend time in jail, but considering my recovery and physical therapy would have been confined to the hospital for the next few months, I was simply ordered a year probation after my release. I know some stories like this skip forward a bit and you are probably expecting me to pick up after I was home, but the trouble started the day after my video call hearing. I had no visitors. My behavior had alienated me from most of my friends. I had used up my favor with my family. My parents had bailed me out of so many bad situations. They had given me so much money over the years they could not stand seeing me. They were sure I would be right back to the bottle. And subsequently, I would be in jail before the year was up. So I was very shocked when a nurse pushed open my door. She entered with a large wicker basket full of flowers. She placed it neatly on the rollaway dining tray and adjusted the bouquet. I asked who they were from, but she said that it did not say. The basket had been left at the nurse's station. It came with simply a card that had my name scrawled across it. No one I knew would have done this. And the basket seemed a bit much. The day was filled with pain. I scanned through reruns on television, and I relived the events of the crash. The doctor would come by periodically. The nurses visited a little more frequently. They would give me a once-over and ask about my pain levels. The staff had been instructed not to give me anything stronger than I needed to manage it, which wasn't much. Despite the damage to my body, the ringing in my head bothered me the most, like a splinter wedging its way into my brain slowly. It wasn't until one of the nurses decided to open the curtains, the sunlight splashing across the room, that a realization hit me as hard as the crash. Those bright beams quickly illuminated the flowers in the basket. My eyes darted toward it. I saw red, yellow, and pink flowers dotted between grassy foliage. I felt a chill creep down my pained spine. A cold sweat began to beat along my forehead. I began to shake violently. The nurse scrambled to stabilize me. She called a code that echoed in my ears, right before my vision blurred to black. The muffled sounds of footsteps rushing to my room echoed in my ears. Then they were replaced by a whisper from a strained and gravelly voice. Ricketts. I did not wake up until the following day. The doctor tried to explain something about a concussion, stress, and possible withdrawal symptoms, but none of it really sank in. My eyes were fixated on the wicker basket. Visions of pulling myself from my wreck truck passed through my mind. Blood mixed with dirt. I clawed my way across the grass and came to rest by the little wooden cross and the bed of wildflowers. My hands pulled at the colorful blossoms as I tried desperately to flee from the scene. 
When I could no longer move, my eyes settled on the cross. And as I gasped for breath, I read the name that had been haphazardly carved into the grain, all in capital letters and with a dull blade. Ricky. My next few months were a nightmare. I struggled to do the simplest of things. Even when I was finally able to walk, I stumbled through every motion. But as soon as I could, I made my way across the room. Quaking hands reached for the basket. I'm not sure if it was out of fear or another symptom of withdrawal. The basket was handmade and appeared weathered by time. Some people might say it was chosen for its character, but I knew better. The flowers had faded by this time. A nurse had asked repeatedly to throw it out. I refused. My fingers grasped the card tucked between the dying foliage. My name had been printed in the same way as the sign. Large, dark strokes, as if done by a knife. The hue was more crimson than one would expect from a handwritten note. When a nurse came to check on me later, I was back in bed, holding the card in my hand. My thumb slowly passed back and forth across the textured ripples in the paper. Her voice carried on as she chatted about her day, her boyfriend, and her desire for the day to end. I think they were trying to give me some sense of normalcy. They didn't know what I was slowly discovering. I couldn't wake up without the ringing in my head. I couldn't sleep without hearing whispers. As the days passed, the vision in my head became clearer. My pupils vibrated furiously as I stared at the basket. Then one day, a nurse approached me with a question. I didn't hear her at first. She repeated herself. I'm sorry, what did you say? My dry lips parted again. Uh, rickets. That night, I had a fitful sleep. It was already difficult for me to sleep in the hospital. The pain made it impossible to find a comfortable position. And then... The nightmares began. It was always the same. I walked through a field of uncut grass and weeds. It was warm. A breeze rustled the grass. The night sky was clear. The moon illuminated my path. I approached a tree. The tree. The cross was gone. In its place sat a boy. His back was to me, but I could see his clothing was tattered. He wore no shoes. His feet were almost black from the dirt. He hunched over with his face in his hands. A rational me would have turned away, but I slowly stepped toward the sobbing child. The closer I came, the more I could see. His skin was drawn tight and wrinkled in places, and his legs bent in strange ways. The hands cupped over his face seemed small at first, but then I realized that it was in fact his head that was a size larger than it should be and oddly shaped. The small tufts of hair that managed to cling to his scalp were scattered about, between big patches of wrinkling, bald scalp. My foolish subconscious mind bent at the waist and reached out to place a hand on the boy's shoulder. As my palm rested on the worn cloth, the child's face turned to me with a snap. Ricketts. He cursed as I could now see his eyes. Obsidian-like orbs rested in fleshy sockets, and ominous gray-white light danced in them like fairies. The nose was slim and crooked at the bridge, but the nostrils were wide in a cartoonish manner as reams of snot dribbled from below. The words repeated again and again from an unreasonably wide smile with cracked and peeling lips. The teeth that sat within were turned in unnatural ways to where they overlapped each other, and were seemingly held in place by the mats of grime that clung to them, which forced the gums to pull back away from them in fear. A slimy tongue licked at the gathering drippings from its nose between speaking. The boy slowly rose from his seat, and I began backing away. His hands began clawing at the hair that remained on his head and pulled large clumps away until he was almost completely bald. He just kept chanting, Rickets, Rickets. Rickets, as he followed me, trampling through the makeshift grave that had appeared below the two of us. My lips quivered in horror as I attempted to scream, but nothing escaped my throat. The boy, no. This creature then started pulling at his clothing and ripping the fabric. Within a few moments, he was naked in front of me, and I could see how deformed he truly was. His upper half was wide, 
and his arms drooped far lower than they should. Or it appeared that way, because his legs bowed outward in a very grotesque manner. Once his entire form was visible to me, he began to laugh maniacally and claw at his own genitalia. My mind could not fathom the monstrous sight I was witnessing, and my backward steps picked up in pace. My body shook violently, as if I had been plunged into the deepest of cold. I wanted to run. I wanted to go anywhere but here. I wanted to never see this thing again. So I turned, and when I thought I could be free, my body gave way under me. The scars and pains from the accident fell upon me in an instant, and I crumpled to the ground. My battered fingers clawed at the grass again, in an attempt to pull myself away. But it was no use. Ricketts was faster now. Within seconds, the ghoul was upon me like a rabid monkey, his hands grabbing at me in various places. Fingers pressed against my cheeks, poking at my eye. And when he began to fondle me in places below the waist, I was finally able to scream. I woke in my bed, gasping for breath, and the gown and hospital sheets were soaked in my fear-laden sweat. Well, my friends, we've reached the end of tonight's chilling tale, Ricketts, Part 1, by the talented Locked 334. I hope you've enjoyed our descent into darkness and that you'll carry a piece of the Fear File Chronicles with you as you drift into uneasy dreams. If our story left you shivering and shaking, don't forget to like this video, share it with others who crave a good scare, and subscribe to the Fear File Chronicles for more haunting horrors. Remember to hit the bell notification so you're always among the first to know when a new nightmare awaits. As always, we appreciate your support and would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Sharing your fears and frights with us truly means a lot, so don't be shy to engage with our sinister community. Until next time, remember to embrace the darkness, for it is within the shadows that our most terrifying stories are born. Good night and stay scared.